Hi, I'm Rob Feezy, Neurology Business Manager for Carl Storch UK. Welcome to Bounce 2020. Here behind me you'll see our virtual urology stand. Please follow the link and come inside to take a look at some of our focus product areas. Welcome now to the final session of BAUS 2020. COVID keepers is what we've called this one. The things from COVID that we learnt have changed our practice for the better and that we should keep. This is a summary of who is going to be talking in the session with uh, Zara Gall and Harry Ratton from the Endourology Committee, but also some stars for the future and I will introduce them each separately and they're going to talk us through the reconfiguration of um, management pathways, IT solutions for clinical care, optimising training opportunities during Covid, remote teaching and finally to end on the future of urology conferences. So Zara starts the session, she's an endourologist at Stepping Hill in Stockport, the most recent addition to our endourology committee and as she says, an advocate of day case mini PCNL, and most importantly uh, for our research aspect, uh, the country's top recruiter into the PURE trial. Zara is going to talk about reconfiguring management pathways during COVID. She'll be followed by Kieran Clement. Uh, I should have put a dot on the, on the west of Scotland to include the north in our, in our talk from earlier in the week about the committee. He's an ST4 in the west of Scotland, uh, and involved in the committee of, of BURST, a, a thing close to my heart. And it was a, a great pleasure when we were able to co-opt a BURST member onto the committee to help us with our, uh, our research output. Kieran's going to tell us about the IT solutions for clinical care that the BURST Collaborative have been using for some time. Uh, and there's a much that we can learn uh, from our younger generation colleagues. Of whom the next is Lizzie Chandra, an ST5 from Yorkshire and the Humber, the BSOC trainee rep on our committee, who's done huge amounts of work about inclusion and uh, diversity, uh, has had an extremely busy conference and is going to tell us all about optimising training opportunities during COVID and the things that we can keep from beyond, in which I'm sure that Harry Rattan will be uh, as keen to hear her thoughts and to develop all of the things that he's been working on during uh, remote teaching from the FRCS Your All revision course to the webinar series. And Harry's going to bring us right up to date with teaching opportunities for the future. And then the final talk of the conference will be Paul Sturch, uh, currently an ST7 from uh, KSS, working at East Surrey and recently appointed uh, as the BSOT vice chair. So it was uh, a, a highly lucky happenstance that the three people that we'd invited to, uh, to join this particular session represent BURST, BSOT and the BAUST uh, endourology section. Paul is going to finish the meeting with the future of urology conferences and what we might look forward to over the, uh, the next year or more. So without further ado, uh, on with uh, Zara Gull's talk about reconfiguring urological services.
Hello, my name's Zara Gall. I'm a consultant endourologist at Stepping Hill Hospital in Stockport. My main aim in this short presentation is to highlight some examples from colleagues around the country who've improved management pathways to provide safe, efficient endourology services through this pandemic. In normal pre-pandemic life, I'm sure we've all felt that trying to affect change in the NHS can be extremely slow and inefficient. The COVID-19 outbreak in March stopped all normal elective practices almost overnight. And this crisis created a unique environment to implement changes immediately to deal with the most clinically urgent cases. Clinicians came up with innovative proposals to manage patients safely, and these were implemented at a speed that we've never experienced before. Some of these changes were just a short term means of getting through the crisis, but others feel like a real step forward and must be kept as part of our normal practice post pandemic. I'm going to start with an example of sharing good practice that really got me interested in this topic in the first place. I'm sure we all have a number of patients who are managed with long term ureteric stents. And during the initial lockdown, when we had no access to any operating lists at all, this group of patients whose stent exchanges were overdue was one group that I was concerned about. During a, an endourology committee Zoom meeting in April, Professor Ben Turney from Oxford explained how he had started exchanging stents under local anaesthetic in the interventional radiology suite. He used a flexible cystoscope to insert the guide wire, remove the old stent, and then screened the new stent into position over the wire. I was keen to try this, so I submitted a new procedure form to our clinical advisory group that had been set up in the trust, and they approved it immediately. The interventional radiology suite had stopped all of its elective work, so they had capacity to accommodate a list. And we successfully completed a list of four stent exchanges less than two weeks after I'd first heard Ben's suggestion. Other teams have systematically reviewed all their long-term stent patients to assess whether the stent actually needs changing now or whether it could safely wait another four or six months. And they've used a combination of renal function blood tests, patient history, ultrasound imaging looking for hydronephrosis so that they could clinically prioritise these stent exchanges. I'm sure most of us have had some experience over the last eight months of uh, operating in the independent sector to do NHS work. Um, but I'm very grateful to Deval Bodiwala and Harry Rattan for sharing their experience from Nottingham. They very rapidly set up a triage system to assess endourology cases in their stone MDT, and they assigned them to either the green independent sector site or the red site, depending on their clinical urgency and the patient's comorbidities. They managed to do 95 endourology cases between the 23rd of March um, and the 11th of May with really good outcomes. These were a mixture of uh, ureteroscopies, some PCNLs and some stents. Um, but if you look at the, the dates again, the 23rd of March to the 11th of May, that's really early on in the pandemic when a lot of us, certainly in Stockport, we were doing almost no operating at all. And personally, I was um, mostly doing manual evacuations on intensive care at that time. So I think the main learning point from this is how early they managed to set this up. We must ensure that if our red sites become overwhelmed again, we, we have to maintain capacity to deal with these urgent cases. So this Nottingham model is definitely something to try to replicate as we hit a second wave. For many of us, the area that we've seen the most dramatic change is in our management of acute ureteric colic. For the most part, colleagues across the country report that they actually feel they've been able to deliver a better service to these patients than previously. The NICE guidance on the management of ureteric colic came out in January 2019, but by March 2020, many units, my own included, were still failing to implement this due to the inherent difficulties of changing practices in the NHS. During the pandemic, many have reported increased use of lithotripsy um, to treat ureteric stones. And this is exactly what had been recommended in the NICE guidelines. For many, they found they had extra capacity for ureteric stones because treatments to renal stones were quite appropriately being suspended. 
There have been some excellent examples of collaborative working and the rapid creation of regional networks to facilitate emergency lithotripsy, again, as recommended by both the NICE guidance and the GERFT report. For others, they started offering primary ureteroscopy rather than stenting and coming back for a ureteroscopy at a later date. And again, this is absolutely in line with NICE guidance. In my unit, I had been trying desperately to promote primary ureteroscopy for well over a year, but I'd faced the usual barriers of lack of ava availability of suitably trained nursing staff and sometimes surgical staff, um, lack of time on the emergency list, lack of availability of the laser machine, etc. However, all the arguments that make primary ureteroscopy the right thing to do in normal circumstance carry even more weight during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I was able to explain to our um, senior clinicians that by performing emergency ureteroscopy, the patients would have one admission rather than two. They'd have one general anaesthetic rather than two. Hopefully we'd be able to avoid putting in a stent, which means they wouldn't have to have another admission to have that removed. Um, and there's a much lower chance of readmission with stent complications or pain. So it was a no brainer really, and all of the bar barriers just melted away. So this is an example of a change in practice that we already knew was the right thing to do, but the COVID-19 crisis has really been the catalyst that's allowed it to happen. Um, and, and we cannot and will not let it slip back. Many units I've heard have started using stents on strings to prevent the need for the flexible cystoscopy and stent removal. Other units, for example, UCH, um, who were already using stents on strings, but removing them in hospital, have now started getting patients to remove their own stents at home, often with the support of a urology specialist nurse um, over the telephone, which sounds like a, an excellent system. All surgical patients are now having to attend hospital 72 hours preoperatively for a nasal and or a throat coronavirus swab. And many have used this as an opportunity. So a lot of these patients may have been on the waiting list for a very long time. And if they haven't had a recent MSU, then this could be a perfect opportunity to get a urine culture to help guide antibiotic management during their perioperative period. If their imaging is out of date, again, this could be a good opportunity to update their imaging to allow better planning and occasionally to prevent an unnecessary operation. I know that Darren and colleagues at UCH have been seeing their patients on this visit to discuss their surgery and go through the consent process. As we all know, consent, wherever possible, shouldn't be performed on the day of surgery. It should be done beforehand. And particularly as we're listing a lot of patients from telephone uh, consultations at the moment, this seems an excellent opportunistic service improvement. Um, and I can only imagine it leads to much smoother running of the operating list on the day. So in summary, while the last seven or eight months have been generally horrendous, the crisis has created a unique environment allowing some things to change for the better. It feels like clinical need is now at the top of the NHS agenda again, and clinicians now really do have the power to mould services to best serve their patients. So a final plea, keep sharing these good ideas that work so that all of our patients can benefit. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Darren, for the uh, introduction and the invitation to present this uh, today. So this is IT Solutions for Clinical Care. My name is Kieran Clement. I'm one of the SD4s in urology in the west of Scotland, and I'm also one, uh, part of the BURST committee. So this talk has basically been based on a paper that we recently pushed, published in BMG Innovations, uh, looking at how to perform outpatient consultations and how to make uh, remote working work for your research groups or multidisciplinary teams. So I'll take you through it. So at the start of the COVID pandemic in the 11th of March, uh, there was a joint statement by the GMC and the four colleges who said that employers and educational supervisors, professional bodies need to be flexible in terms of their approach and their expectations of routine requirements. Uh, and it, they also should be may entail working in unfair, unfamiliar circumstances. And I think that was initially uh, aimed at for example, urology registrars working ICU, but it could also be said of uh, how to work remotely using uh, different technologies, et cetera. 
So the impact of COVID-19 is obvious. There's been reduced clinics, diagnostic services, elective surgery, increased waiting times on an already pressurised NHS. And there's been a move towards remote healthcare and teleconsultations, video consultations, follow-up and investigation remotely just after a telephone consultation and departmental meetings and MDTs moving to a, a remote setting. And there's a few programs available that for this and they, they were available prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So Attend Anywhere is quite commonly used, clinic.co. And then there's the more commonplace free video conferencing tools that everybody knows about, Skype, FaceTime, WhatsApp, and NHS X, which is the information governance team for NHS, said it's fine to use these uh, as long as they're specifically, uh, as long as there's safeguarding me uh, measures put in place. So we came up with a seven P's for a successful virtual clinic, and I'll take you through this. So first P is practice. Ensure you're familiar with the system you're going to use, both the IT system, but also the clinical applications, which most people will be using every day anyway. And check that it works off site if you're doing it in your office from home, for example. Make sure the audio visual equipment works, uh, use headphones, that kind of thing. Be patient centered, decide whether the consultation will be audio only or whether you need video conferencing and send instructions to the patient beforehand to know what to expect and how to use it. Confirm that the patient's actually able to speak confidentially and they're comfortable using the technology device. Be professional, same, exactly same as you, as you would be for a, a normal clinic. Find a suitable quiet space, avoid disturbances, don't have your dog barking in the background, maintain patient confidentiality. If the examination is absolutely necessary, either via video or picture messaging, explain the need clearly to the patient, check consent and check consent again, preserve their dignity wherever possible, and be aware that some applications, including the ones that the patient might be using, can record. Plan and prepare for it. Review the patient's file before you start, uh, and in including uh, detailing any difficult con uh, discussions you might be having as well, as well as language barriers and you can have an interpreter included in these as long as you prepare in advance. Perform the consultation and I say perform and it's more of an acting sense. You have to devise methods that, that a patient's going to be able to contact you and also feel safe when they're doing it and set expectations about what you're going to discuss at the start. Headphones are useful to avoid feedback like I said and decide how many times to call the patient if they don't answer. Normally, what we would do is call them two or three times if they don't answer, write a letter. Some people are more comfortable leaving a voicemail, but you have to be aware that other people might be picking up that voicemail or it might be a wrong number that you've got. So don't say any uh, identifiable or sensitive information. And perfect, 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 perfect. It takes time to learn how to set up a virtual clinic and do it well. And consultations early in the learning curve are likely to take longer than uh, you would normally. Um, Find methods of eliciting ideas, concerns, expectations, and you might have to alter the way you listen. Do you use active listening? Maybe patients aren't giving you everything that they want to be. Uh, and then reflect on the process and get feedback from patients and colleagues as to how things are going. And then be precise. Document it as you would normally. Dictate your letter straight away. And if you use written notes, get them to your secretary and get them put on the system as you would normally. So that's uh, remote consultations. The next part of my talk is uh, about how do we plan for the future of telemedicine and then also remote working. So future of telemedicine, dedicated training. I think it's likely in the future if this continues that undergraduates are gonna have to be taught how to do it, setting of core competencies and dedicated assessment and exams potentially, the MRCS maybe, FRCS, and also learning how to triage patients appropriately to telemedicine. Um, some people, for example, testicular tumours, they need to examine, so they're not appropriate, and you need to be able to triage that appropriately. Virtual team working. So everybody's doing their MDTs, or most people are doing their MDTs from remotely, potentially using Microsoft Teams, and there's plenty of different software platforms which enable you to do that appropriately and successfully. I like to think of the programme that you pick as an anchor software, as it's an anchor which holds all the different programmes that you might want to use together and acts as a central hub and messenger which can link other software tools in. So again, there's a few examples. The one that most people would be familiar with would be Microsoft Teams. Uh, the other most popular one is Slack down at the bottom. And essentially, they're just a central program which can link um, video conferencing in. You can have to-dos and reminders, calendars and meetings can be linked. Uh, occasionally, you can link in social media, such as Twitter, if you're using it for research purposes or for group meetings. You can have cloud document storage. 
one of the best features is collaborative document editing rather than track changes uh, and version 23 on your word files uh, and then obviously it can link to your email as well there's some benefits and uh, downsides to everyone for example um, both slack and microsoft teams are free microsoft teams have got a contract with the nhs at the minute and slack has a free free plan with options for upgrades depending on what you need they all have central messaging, so you can uh, use it like a WhatsApp service. You can subgroup threads into different working practices, and I'll show you an example of that in Slack in a second. Document edition is the best, best thing in my, my view, rather than everybody editing a Word document separately and sending it by email. You can see what people are doing in real time, make comments on changes, multiple comments within threads. It's really good. You can have calendars and deadlines, set reminders for patients, uh, for people, so they get uh, automate, automated emails. And then you can have project management as well. So Slack can work with third party apps such as Trello, uh, where you can have an overall oversight of different threads within a, a, significant, uh, within a specific project. And Microsoft have the same with Microsoft Planner. This is a this is just a screenshot of my screen. So I, we use Slack and Burst, uh, on, as you can see on the right, and we have the different channels. So, for example, Detour, uh, Resect, our newsletter, and only the people who are relevant to each channel will be included. And then you can have separate subgroups, chats, set reminders within within each channel of jobs you need to do. Another good example that uh, I'm sure Mr. Rattan will talk about in the uh, in one of his talks coming up is the FRCS urology. So they use Slack again, extremely successfully using subgroups for andrology, endo urology. People can chat, say thank you for uh, hosting the talk, suggest further talks, share links to the talks. It, it, it works very well. So in summary, the future is now. Everybody has to get used to it, unfortunately. Uh, virtual clinics, you need to prepare, practice and perfect. It's not appropriate in all situations. Learn from your colleagues' uh, experiences chat to your colleagues and your patients and see what works well and what doesn't. For virtual team working, find a software program that works well for you. Slack's the obvious one because everyone uh, is using it in the NHS, but there are other options available. And these encourage collaboration and ease of organization of your working week. Um, collaborative document creation, I've highlighted again, it, it's a must. End email trails with v23.final for Word documents for project planning or research and track changes as an evil which must be stopped in my opinion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that, Tamer. Um, really interesting talk. My name is Kieran Clement and I uh, am one of the other Burst Core committee members and I'm going to talk about our, one of our new projects called Detour, which has been in, uh, in the works for a couple of years now. So it's one o'clock in the morning, uh, you receive a phone call from A&E, you've got a 17 year old uh, boy with slow onset worsening left testicular pain for the last six hours or so. He's got a bit of mild suprapubic pain, he's a bit nauseous, but no symptoms of a UTI, no history of trauma, but he is sexually active. Urine dip shows leukocytes only, observations are normal and he's apyrexial. You examine him and he's got tender, mildly, mildly swollen left testicle, but it's normal lie, no blue dot sign, Abdomen's a bit tender superbically, but nothing else. Um, and he actually looks quite comfortable. So I suppose the question is, what do you do? And I would bet the vast majority of people in this uh, situation would explore. Some people might just admit them and do an ultrasound in the morning. Some might try and persuade their radiologist to do an ultrasound overnight, probably unlikely. Some might just give antibiotics because he's got leukocytes in his urine and a bit of superbuic pain. Some might discharge, but I would I would bet the vast majority in that age would probably explore. So why is that wrong? Or why is that difficult? So the negative exploration rate, as Tim has already said, is 20 to 50%. So 20% in Mortinatal 2018, 50% Maluku, 46% in Nassan. And that's quite high for what is essentially a diagnostic test. So is this rate of negative torsion in exploration acceptable? So we asked our PPI uh, representative last year and she said, in this day and age where diagnostic imagery has come on leaps and bounds, it isn't really acceptable to do an exploratory operation in order to get that diagnosis. And then when we first presented this, uh, Simon Morton presented it uh, in 2018 at our burst session, one of the audience members said, we sit here in 2018 and the diagnostic test for testicular torsion is an operative procedure with a 20% positive predictive value. That can't be right, can it? Quite a contentious uh, viewpoint, I guess, uh, for the vast majority of urologists. 
So what are the alternatives? So as Tamer, Tamer said, you could you could try and get an ultrasound, but it's not routinely available out of hours and it could delay the time of the theatre. The twist score is good if they have a score of five, six or seven, but what about in those patients with a twist score of three and four? Those patients and you're, you're not really sure whether you should be exploring or not. And that's where the difficulty comes in. So that takes us to DTORP. So it's detection of torsion by registrars and training. And our overarching aim of this project is going to be determine whether POCUS, point of care ultrasound, and the twist score can be incorporated in routine clinical practice in the UK in order to better select patients for scrotal exploration. How are we going to do it? So three phases we've planned. So the first is incorporate POCUS into the clinical pathway. The second is to determine the accuracy of that in this setting. And then thirdly, to assess whether focus could reduce the negative uh, rate of negative exploration whilst maintaining a low to zero rate of mistorsion. Arguably, the first, uh, the first bit's quite difficult and the second and third bit are actually a wee bit easier. So we'll start with them. So phases two and three. So phase two is essentially a diagnostic accuracy study. Patients come into A&E with acute scrotal pain. You assess them as you would normally. Uh, and you make the decision as to whether you're going to take them to theatre or not. Once that decision has been made, we then will ask registrars to do a scrotal ultrasound after appropriate training. And from that, we can get the sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value. For the patients that aren't being explored, we're going to follow them up at probably about 90 days um, to determine whether they've come back to A&E, GPs made a referral, whether they've had another ultrasound. Secondary outcomes will be adverse events, rate of testicular atrophy, rate of mistorsion, or rate of negative exploration. And then the dream for BURST, uh, we've aimed to do an interventional study one day, is to, uh, if phase two works well, we could then move on to an RCT on focus. Dif uh, the difficult part comes in phase one. How do we actually train urologists to do ultrasound? How do we incorporate that into the clinical pathway? There's been a few studies on that previously. So the first one in Canada, um, uh, carried a, a joint genital urinary POCUS teaching program for the emergency physicians and the urology residents uh, and then assessed them. Um, in another centre of America, they have intra-departmental certification um, that rates residents and attendings into different user levels. And then thirdly in Canada, another one they've done is a Delphi study where they um, looked at 24 residents in urology, trained them how to do POCUS and then uh, assessed them. Um, that's not actually made it to clinical practice or a published study as of yet. The phase one outcomes would be feasibility. How easy and successful is it to train urologists in ultrasound? How easy is it to access ultrasound when you need it at one o'clock in the morning? Images of ad adequate quality make a diagnosis. Time taken to perform the ultrasound. Does it delay patients in getting to theatre? Uh, and this is essentially our feasibility study. The overall DTORT objectives is to investigate the diagnostic accuracy of Doppler scrotal ultrasound carried out with surgical registrars and patients undergoing emergency scrotal exploration. Secondary objectives would be to determine current clinical practice regarding investigation and management uh, of patients presenting with acute scrotal pain. That would give us uh, new data for the UK. And they can also further elucidate their previous studies and the incidence of negative exploration. We'd be able to assess the predictive value of clinical features in patients presenting with acute scrotal pain to identify torsion. And then potentially, if ultrasound works, we'd be able to develop a composite score utilizing clinical and radiological features to predict the likelihood of particular torsion using ultrasound performed by surgical registrars. And if it's proven successful, it may well be that in the future, ultrasound training is incorporated into specialty training curricula for surgical trainees involved in the assessment of acute testicular pain. And that might, be, might seem a bit of a um, blue sky dream, but the gynecologists do it. They have training as part of their, uh, as part of the curricula. Why can't we? So join the POCUS revolution. This project's just still in the um, feasibility phase. Um, I'd be happy for any thoughts emailed to me or through Twitter. Um, and if anyone's keen to be involved, please get in touch. Thank you. Good afternoon. For my part of this session, I will be talking from the perspective of a trainee about the elements of our work lives that have been positive during the pandemic. It is clear that the response of trainees and medical students across the country to this pandemic has been inspiring. 
Alongside their consultant colleagues and all other health professional and NHS colleagues, trainees have answered the needs of the patients we see, working in unusual ways in new departments with new teams. And out of this has come some brilliant changes in the way we work, things that have improved the training or made the best of the training that could go ahead or made the lives, working lives of trainees better in some way. So today I want to share with you the top 10 that I've either experienced or collated from colleagues around the country. Obviously, there have been times when work and training has been challenging and it's definitely not all been sunshine and roses. But through the challenges and less good days, some elements of good have come. And it's important to recognise these, share these elements of good practice and continue with the best bits as we, at some point, move on from the pandemic. So in top place, we have remote working. The pandemic presented many difficulties in our attempts to keep the services going. With some colleagues requiring to shield and others to self-isolate at various points, one of the ways we were able to maximize effectiveness was to set up people with remote access to allow them to work from home. This has been particularly helpful for continuing clinics, but also has had an advantage that patient records can be accessed anywhere with a Wi-Fi signal, which can also be helpful when operating on patients in the private sector facilities. Various ways of achieving this have been adopted, including providing trust hardware in some cases and in others having online access, which is possible through personal devices with appropriate capabilities. For trainees, this has been well received. Doing a clinic on the phone, in your PJs for those who choose this attire, has felt positively sublime compared with the usual chaos of a face-to-face -face clinic and an overcrowded waiting room. Remote, remote supervision with trainers on the phone has not been a limiter or of concern to the trainees who have found their trainers to be available and still offering the input that they need. From a lifestyle point of view, some trainees have said it's allowed them to recuperate better after busy on calls, helped them feel a bit more in control when their rotor has been changed and allow them some time to manage the competing demands of family and work during a pandemic when childcare arrangements have fallen apart and there's more to do at home. Another big benefit that trainees have reported is the breaking down of silos. The changes in rotors and being redeployed, which although in many ways was not ideal, has led to teams with a mix of doctors from different backgrounds and specialties, the likes of which has only previously been seen on the team of house. This has created stronger bonds between juniors in the hospital and a greater sense of camaraderie. As trainees have returned to their normal departments and rotors, this has improved patient care, particularly for the sickest patients, as trainees have been much more collaborative in their approach to take treating patients with multiple system pathology and those needing critical care input. Moving on, it's clearly not possible and not of overall benefit to training to have mass redeployments each year. But how can we continue to develop the relationships which, require, which are required to ensure we offer the very best patient care at all times? Working in the public sector, the value of investing in such things as relationships and team working can be overlooked or certainly not paid as much attention to as it is in some of the best and most innovative private sector companies. The very real impact of strong working relationships cannot be underestimated, and it is something that maybe we should pay attention to moving forward. Trainees are well, a well-placed pool of people where cross-department knowledge and relationships is clearly of benefit to patients, especially in out-of-hours situations. The redeployment of trainees also had a knock-on effect of exposing them to new skills and knowledge. Trainees are, in general, eager to learn and happy to develop any new skill that might be helpful in their practice. On an individual level, this may be helpful to the trainee and their patients, but unfortunately, the current system doesn't really allow for this to be recognised. Because of the highly structured way that training is designed in the UK, it has been impossible to evidence this learning or have it count for anything. Now, as I said, doctors in training are always happy to learn new skills and knowledge, but we also quite like being able to have it recognised. 
During COVID, HEE and the Academy of Royal Colleges have looked at this and work is ongoing to find ways of formally recognising this experience that has been gained. This may have utility for a trainee changing career paths or wanting to consider dual qualification. And it would also be of value to a response to the second wave. And with that particular point in mind, FICM, the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine, have released a COVID skills passport. This is a self-certification exercise. Although signatures of supervise are, supervisors are asked for, it does not objectively measure competence. It is mostly designed for helping with more appropriate redeployment should that be needed in the second wave, but has also been a great way for trainees who were redeployed to record some evidence of their COVID experience by uploading this to their portfolio. With each college having its own portfolio set up, showing wider experience from outside the specialty can be challenging. This is something trainees would like to see more work going into in the future. As they say, every day is a school day and no knowledge is bad knowledge. So we would quite like to record it. The next to enter my top 10 is the emergence of rest facilities, which were places you might actually want to spend some time. And these emerged during COVID. Pre-COVID, often rest facilities were either non-existent, not adequate for the number of st staff that they served, or not somewhere that you'd be entirely comfortable leaving your pet goat in. So not only were rest facilities facilita uh, sorry, not only were rest facilities created, decked out to a suitable standard with chairs, kettles and nice touches such as pictures, there was often biscuits, tea and coffee available. Some hospitals alongside their rest facilities also created wobble rooms for those needing a moment to step away from the intensity of the clinical floor, decompress and reset. Additionally, many trusts made all trainees automatic members of the doctor's mess at no charge. The impact this has had on trainees has been huge. This simple step has helped the trainees feel valued, wanted and included. As a somewhat nomadic workforce, trainees can find it difficult to feel like they have a place, that they are wanted or valued. Every year we battle with HR and IT for all the things that we absolutely require to do our job. And then we find there's nowhere to eat lunch, free from interruptions, nowhere to get emergency toast and tea at 3 a.m. and nowhere to decompress with fellow colleagues when it's all a bit overwhelming. Access to a mess has been of huge benefit to the hospital where these trainees work and the value added far outweighs the cost and really should be considered as a strategy moving forward. Now we all know that operating during the peak of the first wave ground to a halt. As things have restarted, trainees have reported that lists are running at a reduced capacity. Where there were six cases, there might now be four, and this has had a number of positive impacts for training. Firstly, time to train. The pressure is off and trainees are finding that they are being granted more chance to take the lead on surgeries and having more invested in their operating skills. It also means that some days of the week they're finishing on time. Now, most people accept that our job requires staying late, at least sometimes, even on a fairly regular basis. But when this becomes the norm for every day, it gets tiresome. Going home on time is allowing trainees a better opportunity to reflect on their learning for the day, possibly write some notes or do a quick bit of reading, which is massively improving their training experience. So maybe the capacity of training lists should be considered for the future. Now, I understand my next point might be a slightly controversial one. Trainees having access to and working in the private sector has not been successful everywhere. And to be quite frank, there's a bit of a north-south divide on this, with the north winning out, and clearly as a passionate northern girl, I take slight delight in this. Early on in the pandemic, there was a move by HEE to gain GMC approval of all private hospitals as training facilities. Now, I was working with the lead dean for this at HEE in Yorkshire and the Humber at the time this happened, and we were the first region to su successfully register all our facilities, so I've got some good experience from our region to share. Access has been particularly successful for urology trainees. By the nature of a decent chunk of our work being able to be done as day case on relatively low risk patients, this access has allowed all trainees, but particularly junior ones, to continue gaining core urological skills and operative experience. 
the biggest bonus in most of our local hospitals is that you're provided with lunch, which literally makes all the trainees squeal with delight. Clearly, moving on, this arrangement with hospi private hospitals will probably not continue in this way. But for bygones now, NHS work has been done in these buildings. And maybe it's time to look at the contracts for this work to maximise the access to training opportunities for all trainees. The next bit of my talk moves on to various virtual options for things that would be normally part of our training lives. Virtual drop-ins and one-to-one -one meetings with TPDs and Health Education England senior faculty have been another feature of training in some places. These sessions have given trainees the opportunity to interact with their trainees without having to travel for hours across a large deanery to a hospital they don't know for a meeting that due to a clinical emergency isn't able to go ahead. The advent of virtual drop-ins reduces the travel burden and squashes the crushing disappointment if clinical needs mean it needs to be rearranged. As we've seen increased camaraderie during COVID and increased emphasis on well-being of healthcare staff, some TPDs have been much more visible and interacted more with their trainees by using virtual platforms. Virtual is also the format that HEE has embraced for ARCPs. Prior to COVID, there were different approaches to ARCP around the country and in difficult, different specialties. Surgical specialties have been known to be more traditional in their ARCP approach, with big panels and face-to-face -face meetings. But this has changed, and feedback from trainees is that this is welcomed. Some people have murmured that this removes an opportunity for hearing about the training programmes from trainees. But the message coming from trainees in the feedback we've received is loud and clear. If you think we're going to tell you the truth about training jobs with issues during our ARCP, you've got another thing coming. So I would suggest that alternative forums for this kind of conversations, like the one we've just talked about, were probably more appropriate. During COVID, guidance for trainees about recruitment, redeployment, training and ARCP requirement were rapidly changing. So there were also many webinars emerging, giving trainees an easy to digest way to understand all of this information from HEE, GMC and the Royal Colleges. Certainly in Yorkshire and the Humber, this was very warmly welcomed by the trainees and has led to a really collaborative approach of sharing information and improving processes at HEE. So this would definitely be something we'd recommend continuing. Finally, I'd like to say a line uh, just on visual formats for teaching. Mr. Rattan will be talking much more about this, but this has been welcomed by trainees and praised for its flexibility and accessibility. And so that's it. My top 10 of changes experienced by trainees that we should continue with or look to develop more as we move through and eventually away from the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much. Hi there, thank you very much for asking me to talk. My name is Harry Ratta and I'm a consultant and a urologist from Nottingham and I'm also the current BAUS lead for Specialist Registrar Education. And I've been asked to talk about things that we can preserve going forward as far as education goes. So I think we're all very used to the traditional comfortable models of education that we've relied upon for so many years, including really excellent regional teaching programs across the country skills courses, hands-on training, as well as non-technical skills, which have been provided both by organizations such as BAUS, as well as commercial organizations. These have been particularly relevant to endourology, where there have been so many brilliant ureteroscopy and PCNL courses. We're, of course, all used to conferences and meetings and the learning opportunities that take place at these, as well as more targeted courses, such as revision courses, so things have clearly changed hugely since the advent of COVID with pretty much overnight the loss of most of these resources for trainees. And I think it's been really important that we've all worked together to fill the gap for our trainees. And I like to think about the current landscape post COVID in two areas really. So non-interactive resources such as literature, videos, podcasts, eBooks, e-learning packages, all these things can be done by the trainee in their own time and don't require interaction, particularly with other trainees and trainers. And these have been around for a long time, obviously, but I think the advent of COVID has really accelerated the development as well as the quality of these resources. And then we've got the more exciting stuff, the interactive resources, which include 
webinars and other online teaching uh, events, um, online courses, including our very own BAUS FRCS Urology course, which we did online this year, um, journal clubs, both in regional teaching days, as well as internationally on social media. Simulation, I'm going to talk briefly about that, because I think that's the hardest thing to, 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 to replicate in a virtual format. And then for me, the, the biggest thing has been the, the building of virtual online learning communities. And if that sounds a bit woolly, I promise I'll make it a bit clearer at the end of the talk. So quickly talking about um, non-interactive resources, things that have already been there. I think there have been the development of some really excellent online courses that trainees can undertake at their own pace. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the brilliant uh, BGA, BJUI knowledge learning packages, which have been around for the last three or four years. But there's been a huge expansion in the number of these courses available. And as well as imparting the knowledge, we have the opportunity to test our knowledge and claim uh, CPD and keep a record of it. So it's, it's just a shining example of how good these things can be when they're done well. The AU also has online courses, which again, give you CME credits. And I think this has been a brilliant fallback position for not just trainees, but for, for many consultants as, as well. Podcasts and vodcasts, now these have always been popular, but I think they've really exploded in popularity um, during COVID. So for example, the BJUI again have been doing this residence podcast series, which dates back to 2018, but there've been a huge number this year. And the great thing about these is that they've actually been recorded by trainees themselves, focusing on targeted learning objectives. And I've got no doubt that these will continue into the next few years, taken up by subsequent generations of trainees, regardless of COVID. Commercial organizations have also provided podcasts and vodcasts as an example of the Stone Smart series um, from Boston Scientific, which has really kind of gathered together some international experts. Here's Ben Chu here, a friend of Baus. Um, who's spoken previously. So I think the challenge of non-interactive resources is that there are just so many of them and it's difficult to know where to start. It's great because it democratizes education. It allows voices from across the country, from across the world, and it allows trainees to produce content themselves, which I think is really exciting. But as with everything, face-to-face -face education, online education, quality control is everything. And I think our role as educators really is to, to make sure that we, we curate these resources on behalf of our trainees and make sure that we fact check them, make sure that we're happy with both the content and delivery. And I think that's a very easy thing to do for most of us. And trainees will benefit hugely from being directed towards the excellent resources that are out there. So moving on to the more interactive elements then that I, that I think we should seek to preserve, I'm going to drop the deadly W word into the conversation and that of course is webinars. I'm sure you're all royally sick and tired of having webinar invitations drop into your email inbox and there is definitely a new phenomenon not quite as deadly as COVID, called webinar fatigue. And I'm sure we've all fallen victim to that. You don't need any uh, antibody testing to, to know when you've, when you've had webinar fatigue, long webinar. And I think that this afflicts all professionals. It's not unique to, to medical education. You can see this article from Business World. And I think one of my key COVID keepers is do not try and run a whole day of webinars that are non-interactive, that are just lectures one after the other, because you'll very quickly lose your audience. But I think there have been some great webinar programs developed during COVID. Um, Again, I will just quickly promote the BAUS webinar series. Now we set this up over the summer on a fairly ad hoc basis, backed up by the brilliant team in, in the BAUS uh, office. So Bev Tompkins, Harry Heald, Louise Finch all helped us deliver these um, during the first surge. And, and they were very well received by trainees and I had a brilliant range of support from my colleagues who were all too happy to give up their free time in an evening and of an evening and contribute. 
And based on the success of this, we've developed a, a program, not just for trainees, but there's now also a consultant webinar series featuring controversial topics and int international experts. And that's held by Sanjay Jain. And then there's an upcoming uh, core trainee webinar series over December, um, which has been developed by Anna O'Riordan and, and her colleagues. So really exciting times. And these webinars are really interactive. There's lots of opportunity for question and questions and audience interaction. I think that's the key to webinar success. And I think there are huge benefits of webinars. They just make learning far more accessible. So you, the fact that you don't have to be physically there means that we can get people from all around the world engaging, experts as well as trainees from around the world engaging, less than full-time trainees perhaps who feel a bit out of touch and want to stay in touch can dial into to teaching from home. Um, the fact that you can ask questions without physically being there makes the whole interaction and Q&A session far more democratic. You can even be anonymous if you're embarrassed about asking a question. And of course, there's a benefit of the iPlayer effect, i.e. you can register for a webinar and if you're busy and can't make it on the day, you, you, you've not really missed it because you can go back and, and watch it um, on the archive. And, and, and I think it fits much more with our modern way of learning. So I think my thoughts on webinars is that we will keep them going forward, even if we do eventually return to face-to-face -to -face teaching and training. I think they've got to be short. They work best with a live host and a panel, which increases the interaction. There's got to be time for both panel and audience interaction. And the key thing I'd say is get to know your technology, rehearse just like you would if you're coming to give a talk at Bouse, rehearse and get to know your technology so it comes off slick on the day. How about courses, including exam revision courses? Yes, you can do these. The technology now allows small group work as well as, as lectures with bigger groups. And particularly with Zoom that we've used for our BAUS FRCS course, we found it was very, very easy to transfer from a lecture format to small group Viva format. And I think, again, as long as you've got someone familiar with the technology and prepared to, to, to fiddle around with it, it can work very, very well and ends up being a very interactive and valuable um, session for the trainees and hopefully not too arduous for the trainers. Hopefully you can get more trainers involved because again they don't physically have to be there. So I think from a personal kind of perspective I think going forward even if we do manage to host our BAUS FRCS course in person next time I'm sure we'll have some delegates and some trainers, uh, Viva faculty joining us remotely. Skills and simulation are probably the hardest things to replicate virtually. And I'm not sure how much of this will take uh, going forward because I think the benefits of hands-on training, particularly with a, a very technology heavy uh, area like endourology, laparoscopy, these are the hardest things to replicate online. But there are some innovative ways of doing it. So for example, encouraging trainees to record procedures and upload them. So peers and mentors can critique them, maybe one way of going forward, developing thought experiments, as my friend and colleague Darren Smith calls them, where you talk a trainee through a typical operation, chuck a couple of complications at them and talk through how they're going to get through that. So that can be a valuable way of doing the operation in your head, even if you're not doing it hands on. And clearly the, the role of mentoring is, is, is crucial for both senior trainees as well as consultants. But the thing I'd just like to spend a minute talking about at the end is this whole business of building a learning community, because I think one of the big things that we've lacked during COVID is that interaction which occurs during regional and national teaching and training um, sessions. And I think it's really important to encourage that interaction, that moral support that trainees do get when they're put together. And there are ways of doing this online. It's not as good as doing it in person, but there are ways of doing it. So for BAUS, we used Slack, which is a great free program. And it's a fantastic way of getting trainees together where they can message each other and form groups and interact with, with both other trainees uh, in the region as well as across the country and even internationally. 
The West Midlands have a very active Moodle platform, which allows surgical trainees from all specialties to get together. And of course, at trust level, we're all familiar with teams. And the benefits of building these learning communities are, of course, communication, timetabling, advertising of sessions, a place to upload resources, be it slideshows, recorded talks, uh, curated learning links. A very important area of moral support. I think COVID has been a massively isolating experience for trainees and the ability to, to interact with their colleagues and know that they're not alone and compare notes, that, that can be achieved partly online. It gives the opportunity for development of, of new research strategies and innovative ways of delivering teaching and sharing ideas. And perhaps most importantly, allows feedback and discussion between trainees and trainers. And certainly our Slack community has gone a little bit quiet of late with everything else, but it's been a huge success and it's been a real privilege to be part of that. So how would you do a teaching day going forward? You might start with a theme and appoint a lead and preferably some co-hosts. Preferably some of them will be the trainees themselves. You might ask trainees to go off and do some online learning as long as you've curated the resources. Then you could have an interactive session encompassing some or all of these things. You could look at surgical videos, case-based discussion or MDTs, journal club, and maybe even some micro teaching, which generally works well. And then why not round off the evening with some practice vivas for those trainees heading for their exams? The technology exists to do all these things, as you can see. So our final thoughts are that we will undoubtedly keep some elements of virtual teaching going even after hopefully COVID uh, recedes into a distant memory. And I think the same principles that apply to good face-to-face -face education apply to virtual education. Preparation, quality, interaction, feedback, all these things are equally if not more important um, in terms of online teaching. So. I think it's been a really exciting and somewhat uneven ride, a roller coaster ride, getting to grips with all this during the last nine months. But I think there are valuable things that we can take going forward. Thank you for listening. Happy to take questions, of course, at the end. Okay, I'd like to um, start by thanking Baus and the endourology section for the opportunity to present on this interesting topic. And I'd also like to thank the um, uh, Baus team in the back rooms for their hard work in organising these sessions. Um, so the future of medical conferences. Speculation has always been a fascination for the human race. Crisis and necessity are great drivers for change. And this year's global events have completely uprooted the planned uh, format of medical conferences across the world with many either cancelled or going to entirely uh, virtual formats. But what does this mean for the future of the medical community coming together to share information? So to try and explore this further, we can start by looking back to see how far we've already come. So since Pheidippides ran from the battlefield in Marathon, to Athens bringing news of the Greek victory over the invading Persian forces in 490 BC, communication technology has come a long way. Skip forward to the mid 1990s where fax machines, mobile phones and the recent launch of the internet had made information sharing over great distances easier than ever. A global community had been created and the world had effectively shrunk in size. And the medical profession hasn't stood still either. Advances in communication technology have been utilized uh, to improve the efficiency and delivery of the health service for years. Telemedicine clinics, video linked MDTs and social media are just a few examples. But while the convenience and um, far reaching benefit of digital communication technologies is undoubted, they've always been used as an adjunct and never a substitute to direct human interaction. It has been theorized in the world of economics that the technological revolutions over the years would lead to um, geographical distances becoming meaningless. But even though the world has become widely accessible, the death of distance have, has never truly come to pass. Important meetings have always 
continued to be conducted face to face, often in groups larger than six and sealed with handshakes, if you can remember those without flinching. When the world went into lockdown just before the start of the spring conference season earlier this year, uh, the medical community was forced to scramble. USANS uh, and AUA in March and May respectively had little warning and had to cancel completely. The EAU had a little bit more time uh, and went entirely virtual uh, in July. And BAUS was able to reorganize running five months later than planned here in November uh, as a virtual meeting with no small amount of effort. So what are the benefits of running an entirely virtual conference? Well, conferences have used uh, mobile phone apps, video presentations and podcasts uh, to record and disseminate information for years. And now that necessity has forced us to embrace the wider use of existing video conferencing software, such as Discord, uh, Zoom and Teams, the benefits um, are clear to see. For delegates, there's no need to travel uh, long distances to attend a meeting, reducing costs in commuting, uh, accommodation and subsidence. And video libraries of recorded sessions can create large banks of information, uh, allowing repeat viewing of key sessions and negating the need to choose between um, important sessions in competing time slots. And for attendees, uh, they're able to watch on a number of devices at their convenience, from theatre coffee rooms, on their commute to and from work, or even from the comfort of their own home, with less impact on their clinical activities. Presenters recording their sessions in advance at their own convenience may remove some of the sweaty palm pressure of presenting in front of a packed auditorium. And this might even remove the barriers for um, the people who are less comfortable in public speaking um, from sharing their ideas. There are also potentially lower overheads for the organisers um, with reduced costs uh, compared to hiring a conference centre. Well, this does come at, at the cost of organisational headaches and having to overcome the technological gremlins along the way. So will medical conferences in the future, when large scale social interaction is again possible, remain entirely virtual? Well, a decade ago, there was an explosion in massive open online courses, which were distance learning education modules available to unlimited uh, participants over the internet. And initially interest in these soared, but then quickly fell away. Um, while colleges and universities continued to recruit. Uh, and while that situation uh, may be forced to change with universities moving to um, entirely online courses, it drives home the importance of direct human interaction in the transmission and reception uh, of information. At conferences, there is exposure to ideas and information, um, but the real additional value can be found in interaction with large groups of colleagues sharing a similar interest and in the chance meetings of people you might not normally uh, get to discuss things with. For example, Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer, who were both involved in the first genetic experiments in the 1970s, uh, met over lunch at a conference in Hawaii. This could not have happened over Zoom. Conferences also provide the potential to expand, uh, expand horizons through travel um, and can present the opportunity for a refreshing break from routine that cannot be achieved by sitting in front of a computer screen at home or at work over a shaky internet connection. So again, an attempt to answer the question, uh, what does the future of medical conferences hold? Well, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. But in the last six months or so, we've all become very familiar with the benefits of um, technology, which we've been forced to embrace. And um, even when a greater degree of normality returns to the world, the nature of the way the medical community communicates and shares information will have been changed forever and for the better. Over the next few years, I'm sure we will see hybrid, com um, hybrid conferences utilizing the best of the analog and digital worlds, um, evolving 
to maintain the benefits of uh, direct face-to-face -face collaboration and networking, along with enabling access to a wider audience for the benefit of all. Perhaps even further down the line, we might walk around conferences using virtual reality headsets, such are already in use in video games, or even be able to present um, projecting across the world as a hologram, as Stephen Hawking did um, in Hong Kong some years ago. Um, so while it's impossible to know how long social interaction restrictions will go on, it is clear that the urological community has faced this period of um, adversity and used it as a driver for positive change. Technology continues to move forward and has great value facilitating communication, but it will never replace human interaction. I'd hope that next uh, summer at BAUS 2021, we'll be able to see the benefit of a symbiotic relationship between social interactions and the advances in communication technology. And some of us may even be able to meet face to face and shake hands. Thank you. So that brings the COVID Keepers session to an end. I hope that there was some food for thought to, I was going to say take home, but of course it's keep at home because nobody's traveled. Some things that you can make changes with or think about and introduce into your own practice. I hope it's been a good meeting for you in general, the opportunity to perhaps dip into some sessions that you might not have seen. There's always things that can be learned from the way that other people do their practice. And the thing that we need to do is to learn from the experience from your feedback. So as always, the BAUS team will send around the traditional survey monkey. And I understand that it'll be possible to give individual feedback from some of the sessions. And that's always useful. The, um, the positive feedback is, uh, is clearly welcome, but the ideas for the future, uh, what perhaps didn't work quite so well, but could be improved or ideas as usual for subject material that you would like to see covered in the future. Included in the official feedback, but as mentioned in the uh, BAUS ENDO update, do let the committee know if there are particular things that you would like to see in meetings that come ahead in the next in the next year or so. So complete the feedback. We'd ordinarily say travel home safely, but you're already there. But do, as these times get more tricky, take care, keep safe and stay well. And we'll all look forward to brighter times in 2021. The logo on the left, this was supposed to be the big celebratory year for, uh, for BAUS, for the RSM, for 75 and 100 year anniversaries. Uh, the one constant is change, um, but the thing that is genuinely constant is the BAUS team. I'd like to thank particularly uh, Harry Heald for his um, uh, never ending patience with me recording these and the emails and the changes of time. Uh, but of course, the whole of the BAUS team that we've not had the opportunity to thank in person um, who've worked away both in London and in Australia. Uh, so literally a 24 hour service as we prepared this meeting. Um, so uh, they get a virtual round of applause uh, and all of our thanks. And to everybody else, uh, we hope you've had an excellent meeting and we'll look forward to catching up in 2021. Take care.